as part of the Canadian Orthopedic Association, we are here uh, to chat a little bit about building a creative mindset. And if I could just share with you, this is a really a personal journey, a journey that I've taken that I'm hopeful that you'll also uh, find helpful and useful. I spent 25 years in the pursuit of evidence-based surgery, data analytics, the conduct of large clinical trials, and more recently have become very focused on developing a creative mindset. But here's the point. YROC Global is one of many, many uh, global groups now thinking about the concept of evolution. In fact, our course coordinators, our president says here, we have faced the pandemic bravely for the last 18 months and have adapted and evolved to, to pace academics and learning. And here's the point, creativity is required to be able to adapt and evolve. In fact, innovation at its best is informed by our creativity and creativity at its best is informed by our pursuit of ideas. Innovation, simply put, is a new idea. And doesn't everything ultimately begin with an idea? The, the fact that we are here today discussing globally um, in a global village concepts around orthopedics really began with an idea. Most advances, in fact, the great ones have always come from ideas and ideas are fundamentally the currency of the 21st century. So we can't take this lightly, friends. A friend and colleague, Professor Rajesh Malhotra says, through ingenious ideas are born treatments that improve upon already established methods. And what he's saying is actually quite true. Peter Thiel, an entrepreneur says, it's very difficult to go from nothing to something before there was a flight to the first flight, you know, before there was a computer or the internet to internet. Those are very, very disruptive technologies. But as I would say to most of you as my colleagues, 99.9% .9 of the ideas we have are often incremental. So when we talk about disruptive ideas, they need not always be going from nothing to something, but often improving on what we already know and adding increment that over time can lead to major, major benefit. In fact, when we look at even research, colleagues from Oxford in a recent paper in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, said to me personally when we were chatting, Professor Costa said, you know, truth be told, what we've done in Oxford with respect to our methodology and the models we've used are really, we've copied from other groups ahead of us. We've added incremental changes to allow us to advance. And friends, in fact, when we think about, you know, pioneers, the, the disruptors versus the experts or the innovators, think of Tenzing Norgay. You know, think of Sir Edmund Hillary. There were the single group of individuals that went and climbed Mount Everest for the first time. But how many thousands have learned from that experience and incrementally improved the oxygen supplies, how we survive, the clothing, and appropriately the roots? So the truth is there is root, there is all kinds of opportunities for both of us. There is the explorer mentality, which there is much higher risk. Um, ultimately, uh, it requires lots of creativity and experiment, but the expert mentality also is important. We decrease the risk by looking at established models. We look at calculation and analysis of that first uh, exploration, and the rewards are big. Not as big as exploration, but the risks are also bigger with exploration. So friends, when we think about ideas, we can think of them in many, many different ways. Now, let me give you an idea that, that, that is a very rare type of genius, a genius that most of us don't normally accomplish. Peter Higgs in 1964 was a theoretical physicist, and he had an idea. Through theoretical modeling, he believed there was a new particle in particle physics that existed, but it could not be proven. In fact, he hypothesized it for many, many decades. It took 44 years for an appropriate experiment and an appropriate technology, the Hadron Collider in 2008, to be able to be created to allow him to test this hypothesis. And in fact, in July 4th of 2012, the Higgs boson particle was confirmed. The truth is he is no longer the young Peter Higgs of 1964, 
But that was a stroke of genius. That was a storm of ideas that led him to this stroke of genius. Appropriately, he won the Nobel Prize in physics in 2013. But friends, here's the point. Genius is very rare. Actually, you know what? It's very, very rare. So we must not get caught up with out of the box thinking as the only way to advance our field in orthopedics. Simply put, genius itself means to generate. It's genere, Latin, to create. And practice makes perfect. And some people say geniuses are made, not born. And in fact, when we look at this simple example, we can teach a child, right, who might be a prodigy to be able to play Mozart, but it's genius. It's genius for Mozart to have actually created that music in the first place. It's one thing for a child to memorize the Krebs cycle, but it was genius for Krebs to actually sit down painstakingly, do the experiments to identify people. Many of us try to paint and copy, you know, the work of Monet, but Monet was genius in moving from realism to impressionism with his very first painting, Impression uh, Sunrise. And this is the point I'm making. We can still make incremental changes, but practice doesn't make perfect. And also, uh, practice doesn't make new. What holds us back, friends, is that we don't learn to be original. So what is creativity? Creativity is inventing. It's experimenting. It's growing. It's taking risks. It's breaking rules. It's making mistakes. And ultimately, it's having fun. And aren't we now in the most innovative time in history? Look at what we're able to do. Look at what this conference globally is achieving. Clearly, we're in an innovative time. We are hyper-connected. These numbers are old numbers, and yet they are still staggeringly high numbers. But here's the sobering truth. Our creativity scores are much less. Children do much better on the same tests of creativity than adults. And in fact, while intelligence has been steadily increasing through our IQ measures, creative thinking is declining over time. And this decline has been steady and persistent. Let me walk you through what happens. We are peak. Go back to your childhood. Go back and look at you know, preschool and the free form ideas, the absolute risk taking that we took as children. And then suddenly we went into you know, organized school and one can argue that school in many ways has slowly, from high school onwards to post-secondary, made us much more conformist, made us much more afraid to take risk and always in search of the right answer. In many cases, there are multiple approaches to the same thing, but we are always forced in thinking that there is one single answer. That has been the absolute opposite of creativity. In fact, one might argue that our post-secondary institutions are, are actually teaching, as Nobel laureates will say, anti-creativity. Three and four of us believe we aren't living up to our creative potential. If you have ideas, but you don't act on them, you're imaginative. That does not make you creative. What makes you creative is the ability to act, to do something. It's, it's a verb. Cause something to happen as a result of one's actions. So when we look at highly creative people, we could say, well, you know, some of these are just luck and hidden advantages. Some of these individuals are wired for higher risks and therefore they have greater rewards. We talked about the innovator culture, those innovators that will climb Mount Everest, that will climb these new mountains for the first time. For some people, work itself is the reward. They aren't searching for the outcome. And in doing the work, they often achieve great things. And then there is that rare, extraordinary human like a Peter Higgs, who had that storm of ideas, just like, you know, Albert Einstein, right, in the early 1900s, said he had a storm of ideas in the early 1900s that led to four pivotal papers, of which uh, some earned him the Nobel Prize. But here I am, in 2018, in Nepal, with a colleague of mine, and we we're staring over into the Himalayan, uh, you know, you can see the Himalayas in the back very distantly in Mount Kachinjunga in sight. And I had that moment of reflection where I said to myself, I think ultimately that the work I've done in my life is only a small part of my total ability. We have to do more. And we have to start really exploring other ways to generate new ideas. 
you wouldn't be that surprised to understand that Nobel laureates are 22 times more likely to perform, to dance, to perform magic, to play an instrument, to write poetry, plays or novels, or to enjoy arts and crafts. In fact, many of them have a diversity of research interests. It's almost as though all types of questions, there is a wonder, there is a curiosity. And because of that curiosity, it allows them to take many disparate ideas and put them together in a novel way. That in itself is creativity in our academic world. Richard Feynman, a Nobel laureate, said that successful scientists have integrated networks of enterprise. What does he mean? Well, he means that the less successful colleagues tend to have fewer non-scientific ideas. Ask yourself this and be honest to yourself. When you are not working, what gives you great deal of pleasure? What do you do outside to keep yourself stimulated when you are not at work? Roald Hoffman, a theoretical chemist says, well, I write poetry to penetrate the world around me and to comprehend my reactions to it. The language of science is inherently poetic. What about Einstein? What did Einstein love to do? And in fact, what did Einstein, what gave him a great deal of idea generation? Well, he was actually a very accomplished uh, violinist. The 2014 Nobel laureate Maybrit Moser, as a child, spent hours and hours and hours studying and documenting the behavior of snails. Ask yourself this, when's the last time in a typical day that you've had the luxury or you've given yourself the permission to simply stop, pause, and look at something as insignificant as a small insect or a leaf or a flower, or just sit and appreciate the sounds around you. This is the type of creativity that leads to individuals having great ideas. 1990 Nobel laureate and economist Harry Markowitz had a love of comics. In fact, he was an avid comic uh, uh, book reader with a special interest in one particular comic book, The Shadow. And the point is it allows an escapism into a different world when you're not working. And ultimately it allows you to tell stories. All of us ultimately have a story to tell. Whether our story is about food and we share that with the rest of the world, or it is about telling jokes through stories. Gifted comedians are often very gifted storytellers. But sometimes you can tell a story without ever having to say a word. But here we are again. Data is our storytelling tool. And when we look at the scientific sessions that are a part of this, and I'm, again, personally honored to be participating on behalf of the Canadian Orthopedic Association, but there are symposia. There are meet the master sessions. There are so many ways in which we can engage in idea generation with individuals who are like-minded, but also have a different viewpoint. We need to surround ourselves with that type of information and that type of uh, in individual. And the truth is, if you own the evidence, you own the story. So at YROC Global, when we look at the evidence, we must be telling ourselves what stories can we glean from this evidence? When we look at the 500 most popular TED Talks, two thirds of them aren't just presenting data, they are telling us stories. So let's look and find the stories in the next few days. Let's look at what's available to us and let's find the real pearls. On a personal level, I've been able to tell stories looking at trials. And this is a history of trials that we've done from 1998 to 2022 with over 50,000 patients recruited and randomized. We've had the luxury and the privilege of publishing uh, in many top journals and numerous uh, papers that have come out that has helped us change and tell stories. And friends, research that matters to me now as I look back at my career should be significant for everybody. It should create a global connectivity the same way we are connecting today. It should grow our team and it should contribute to the well-being of all people. That should be our ideal. We should really be thinking about that because it takes a globe to find the important questions. And ultimately, we need meaningful interactions and collaborations to be creative. So today, let YROC Global and all of the amazing organizers and presenters help us generate new ideas. Let's generate new discussions and let's connect all of us in storytelling and creativity. Thank you very much. Uh